Hey everyone, welcome to tonight's vlog, or actually this morning's vlog. It is 1 in the morning on January 15th, 2024. Right now we're driving on Route 12 in New Hampshire. Route 12 is about to turn into the Kankamangas Highway, which is a very scenic place. It's nighttime, so we won't be able to see much. I have a few videos from a few months ago when the nice fall foliage was out. Today, I'm imagining the snow will probably be twice or three times as deep because we're going to climb an elevation really fast. I haven't done a vlog video in a while, so I'll talk about some random subjects over the course of the next half hour or so. I'm kind of curious how deep the snow will get. So I had a pretty productive day today. In an upcoming video, I made that smoke, I made a smoker out of that large propane tank I have in the woods. I've used it in camping videos before. I have a video of cleaning it out, getting rid of the propane, and making it into just a camping stove. But now it's a smoker. I put hinges on the door. I put the piece of metal back in place that was removed. Thankfully I kept it because it's a perfect fit for a door. I made a large upper door so you can reach in there and hang meat hooks on a rod I stuck through it. I use a piece of copper pipe which, yeah, it gets soft when there's heat in there so it bowed a little bit. I'll have to get a proper piece of rebar. I only use copper so I could bend it on the outside so it wouldn't slide out but I'll just have to get rebar. It's rigid, it's not gonna just slide out, so it doesn't really matter. But that's one improvement they'll have to make on it. And that's actually smoking right now. I left maybe three hours ago from the house and I did some tree work for a family member. And yeah, so a fir tree, which aren't very heavy, fell over onto the house, damaged the roof a little bit, it might start leaking, but in the spring that'll have to be fixed, or at least tarped. Just a little bit of minor shingle work, work on the roof, you can see some sticks jammed into the gable vent, that's also going to be included in that smoker video. So, the tree broke off on the roof, slid down the side of the house, scraping off a bunch of the wood shingles. Then it ripped into the house, and you could look in the hole, see sheetrock and insulation. But there's a family friend contractor who will probably do it for about a thousand dollars in the spring once it gets nice. For now, the hole will just be spray foamed so mice and squirrels can't get into the building. But I went over there, cut it up into 18 inch logs so it can be seasoned and thrown into the fireplace next year, and draggable pieces. Maybe the kids will like to do that stuff. Make a bonfire with the sticks. So I cut it up into manageable pieces and left it there. If it's still there in the spring, I'll offer to move it with a wagon. But did that today also with the smoker. So there are some trees in my property I could cut branches off of, which would be good to smoke with. I believe I have cherry, cherry trees. Also, cedar trees can be good that grow around here. I don't personally have any on the property. I also have some apple trees, crab apple trees, but I think their wood might still be good to smoke with. Um, I have some low branches I could prune off and maybe use that for future smoking. Wet wood is actually good because it'll smolder and smoke a lot without burning, but I didn't have any of that, so I bought a box of already dried apple logs at the store. That was cheap enough. It's made for smoking. So that went good. The only thing is the only the hinges I bought are for gates. And I guess to prevent the gate from squeaking, it's got these rubber spacers in it. They melted, which made the door sag only a millimeter or so. But I'll have to compensate for that by maybe grinding the bottom of the door a little bit so it can seat again properly. But that went well. I just rolled the tank through the woods. The hand truck wouldn't go through the snow. I have about six inches of snow at the house. Right now you're seeing maybe a foot on the side of the road here. Maybe we'll get even deeper snow by the time we get to this high elevation spot. But that thing's smoking right now. It's been
been smoking for the last three, four hours, so when I get home, the meat might be done. Hopefully, it kept its temperature. I've never smoked meat before. I've only watched one person recently do it and one person like five years ago do it, and um, it seems to be working fine. I don't think I need any more air holes. I crack the door ever so slightly and it starts flaring up in there. So that should be good. I literally loaded that tank. I um, don't know how many gallons it is. I believe maybe 90. Maybe I'm wrong. But I loaded it almost to the top with wood. Let it go back down to coals. After about two hours, we had a four foot pile of logs stacked inside of the tank. It went down to less than a foot of coals within the two hours. It burned fast. That thing runs like a rocket stove when the door is open. And now, on top of the hot embers, you throw the nice seasoning or the smoking wood on top of it and shut the door immediately so there's not enough air for combustion. It just smokes a whole ton. The smoke smells really nice once the meat started cooking. So that's what I did today. I thought it was a pretty productive day. Smoker was a lot easier to do than I thought. I didn't weld anything. I just used an angle iron or an angle grinder is what I used. Worked a lot better than the reciprocating saw, less vibrations. I only went through two blades for that grinder amazingly. It worked out very nicely. Reciprocating saw, I went through so many blades cutting the smaller door years ago. But we'll check on that tonight and I'll post that video soon. A couple weeks out maybe, I'll get that edited together. Also people asked me in my comment section, my experience the first time going through the Canada border. So. A couple years ago, I accidentally crossed the Canada border. I have a video of that. I actually recorded the whole thing because I was up there to do a trail. I don't know what it's called, but oh yeah, it's the, I think the third or fourth Connecticut Lake. Yeah, it's in northern New Hampshire, like literally half a mile from the border and so it's a trail that's literally on the border. You're back and forth, maybe 20 feet on each side, here and there, that kind of trail. It allows you to cross the border like 20 feet and so without a passport or anything. But when I got there, the parking spaces had faded away so much. There's no sign telling you where to park for it. There's just a sign saying trail pointing through the gates. So I drove through the gates and because I crossed the border, I had the go through it was during COVID times they were even afraid to touch my ID and stuff but after processing for 20 minutes or so they sent me right back over and then the US checkpoint to briefly search the vehicle not thoroughly they knew it was an accident but I guess they were bored so they decided to search through a few things but they were very nice about it anyways because of that mess up right there my next time crossing I didn't think that actually counted. I didn't have a passport or anything. They asked, have you ever been in Canada before? And I said no. And that was suspicious, so they had to bring me in the building for processing there to figure out why I said I was never there before, but their computer said I was there before. So for that reason, I had to go into their building, and they had to confirm, and I explained that good thing I had a video of it. That helped a lot, too. They actually watched that video of the mess up to figure out what happened. And after that, they asked me to open my bank account to make sure I had enough funds to support myself while in the Canada. And after that, they let me go without a problem. So after that, I crossed the border again without a problem. Even that first time, or that second time crossing, the mess up where they had me process, they didn't search the car or anything. So, it's pretty easy to go through the border. I don't need, actually need my passport. I have a passport card. I believe it's only available to border states. I don't think if you live in the middle of the U.S., you can get it. I might be wrong. I don't know. But I was told that. 
So if you live along the Mexican border or the Canada border, you can get a passport card so you don't have to carry around the big bulky passport book. And some people that live next to the border may cross it all the time. There's literally communities in northern Vermont, it's easier for them to cross the border and go shopping to then actually go in the other direction. Some of those people have caused chaos for them when the border was shut down for a year or so during COVID because they have a shopping plaza right there over the border, but yet now they have to drive over an hour in the other direction to get to a Walmart or something. Oh, look at this. We're going, look, the snow got deep fast. I have been paying attention to that this, while I'm talking the snow got deep fast but yeah anyways if you have a passport book I believe they stamp it every time you go through the border but if you have just a little card it's like a driver's license they don't stamp it or anything they just look at it so that makes things a little bit easier you don't have to carry a book around you just, I just have it in my wallet behind my driver's license so it's always there if I have to use it a lot of logging roads actually cross the border too those checkpoints, I don't know exactly how they work. I believe some of them don't even have someone at them half the time. I've seen log trucks pull up to them and the gates just open. And then they shut. I guess the log trucks, because they cross so many times a day, maybe they have some sort of pass that opens. I don't know how that works. I really don't. I've just witnessed them go through without a single person physically going up to the truck don't know how that works or if I can even use those points but a lot of log trucks in northern Maine um, they collect the logs they go over to Canada to a sawmill gets processed into lumber and sent right back into Maine for some reason I guess that's easier because the wilderness in Maine is big They'd have to go pretty far in the other direction to get out of the wilderness, but Canada's right there, so I suppose that's why. Also, Canada does a lot of the pressure treating. We send our logs there to their sawmills, and they do a lot of the pressure treating. Like, if I go into any Home Depot or Lowe's near me, a lot of the lumber says Irving on it, which I believe is in Canada. I might be wrong. I've been told by people like the Irving gas stations that are all over northern New England are owned by a Quebec company. I'm not sure about that, though. I was just told that. Yeah, the snow's getting really deep now. If you can tell, that pile to the right is like three feet tall, nearly a meter tall right there. The snow bank's getting tall, and we haven't even gone up the hill that much yet. This hill just started. There's going to be some hairpin turns. There's no one on the road, so I'm just going to use the off-road lights for a better view. If I see a car, I'll just treat it as a high beam and shut it off. Some communities in northern Maine allow you to do that with your off-road lights because there's mostly dirt roads and stuff there, which the visibility on a dirt road is a lot worse because there's no lines to keep you in Oh, here's one of the hairpin turns. We are getting pretty high up. I don't think that's the severely sharp one. It may have been. Yeah, it was the severely sharp one. So we are closer to the top than I realized. Another five minutes or so we might get to the top. Then we'll start going down in elevation, which is a good thing. Don't want to be this high up in elevation and have to go down the hill when the road is snow covered. This area, especially higher up, they'll probably get more. We're supposed to pick up at least a few inches of snow tonight. It's already starting to snow if you can see the flurries. I can barely see them with the naked eye, so I don't know if you can see them yet. It's supposed to pick up in the next few hours, so that's why we're heading back. Well, this road's scenic. That'd be a nice place to make a vlog and talk about some things. I wish I had this amount of snow at the house. I want to make another snow fort if we get enough this year. I'll snow blow the whole yard into one pile and carve it out. Make another Quonset hut. If that's if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I wish we got deep enough snow to actually have what you call snow pack. Like the layers of snow get so deep that it compresses the bottom so much. I experienced that in the main wilderness last year. I have a video camping in the middle of the road. It was a logging road that's not plowed. 
And so I dug down. I had to dig at least three feet down into the snow and I set up my tent. It took quite a while to dig out three feet enough for the tent and I had towering piles around me, which was nice. It was like insulation protecting me from the wind. And I dug down and it was, you could see the different layers of different snowstorms. The bottom layer was so compressed I had to chop it with the shovel into like blocks to get rid of it. I could have used those blocks to make an actual igloo. I wish we got snow that deep and heavy where I live. We used to, but in recent years we haven't got anything like that. Two years ago was one of the hardest winters I've ever experienced as far as cold. We had negative 30, negative 40 every single night for like six weeks straight. All the raging rivers, the waterfalls, they all froze solid. That was awesome. Every body of water, even rushing bodies of water were safe to walk on. Now we're starting to go downhill. Go around some of those corners where the plow has to push it to one side a little bit more. That was like almost four feet. I was, yeah, right here is almost four feet to the right side. No, it looks like we are still actually going up a little. That was just a little dip. The road's getting a little narrow here too because the plow can't push it all the way off with the guardrail there. Every now and then when it gets extremely deep on mountain roads like this, they'll have the plow come by or a special machine to push it very far off the road. It's nice to see this deep snow. I'm hoping California gets that really deep snow again like they did last year. Some areas got like 20 feet. And 20 feet is like what? Six yards? I mean six meters? Yard and meters about the same. But that was awesome to see the footage of that. People had to keep shoveling off their roofs. It was burying two-story buildings that was so deep in the mountains there. I hope that happens again. I'll throw chains on the vehicle and drive up in those communities. That'd be cool just to get some footage of that. California used to get that all the time. Past 20 years, they've been in a pretty bad drought. Last year was like the first year in decades California didn't have a huge water issue from people overusing it. Most of the reason that it's overused is because people watering lawns and stuff that shouldn't be in the desert. But there's also a lot of farms there too. It's a great place for farming because you can farm year-round in places like Southern California and some of the neighboring states, but it has to be irrigated because it doesn't rain in those areas. They rely on the rivers from snow melt in the nearby mountains that cross through the desert, the, mount, the runoff, the rivers cross through the desert. That was cool to drive through the desert last year. I'm hoping to do a southern trip in another couple of months while the weather's still cooler. I think the, the far southern states, I'll probably drive through those ones pretty quickly because there are a lot of venomous animals there. And I don't think it'll be that cold where they'll be in hibernation and I don't want to come across anything like that. So I'll drive through because I want to see the areas and see the tropical areas of... Um, like Florida, I want to do some off-roading. I know the Everglades has some dirt roads and stuff that pass through it, but definitely not going in their culverts. There could be alligators in there, or poisonous snakes, or I should say venomous snakes. So I'll stay away from that. And if I do a venture out into any abandoned places when I'm in the tropics like that, I'll just wear very tall boots to hopefully protect against the snake biting. I think that would work. My big high boots are pretty thick. They're insulated on the inside a little bit. And maybe in the summertime I want to do a cross-country trip in northern Canada and maybe go into Alaska during the hot summer because it'll be nice and cool up there for that. This was one of the coolest summers on record for my area. Average high was 68 this summer, last summer, 2023. Average, historically, is 76 for the high during the summer. Two years ago, the average was 91 in severe drought. That killed a lot of the trees because most of the trees are pines, which don't have deep roots. They only run a few feet deep. 
and that few feet during the drought dried up. That's why there was massive die-offs, especially of balsam fir and the eastern white pine. Many of the leafy trees just went into hibernation and they came back pretty nice this year. They went into hibernation early because of the lack of rain. Snow is still pretty deep here and you see some of those big snowballs. Yeah, we had heavy wet snow so when the plow goes by and pushes it up, some of those big snowballs roll back down into the road. And on nights like this when it's cold, they harden and you can hit those pretty hard. It's like hitting a rock because they freeze solid the heavy wet snow. When there's heavy wet snow and you have a nice hill it's fun to make a snowball. It will literally roll down the hill like in the movies and it'll get big in the right conditions. Like a little snowball it'll turn into something huge that could actually destroy something if it was on the hill. It's currently 24 degrees outside. It was 35 degrees at the bottom of the other side. Just going in elevation like this, it got cold. A bit, we lost almost 10 degrees. We did lose 10 degrees, 11 degrees. Now we're going down the other side pretty soon. I think we'll be driving through Conway, New Hampshire. It's not snowing anymore. It, that stopped quickly, but it's a, right now we got like a 50% chance of snow. The radar is showing it's snowing, but a lot of it's not reaching the ground. If the air is dry, even snow will dry up before it hits the ground. It's absorbed into the air. So we got to wait for the air to become more saturated before it gets down to the ground. I'm hoping we get some big storms like this in my area soon. I've only had to use the snow blower once and I didn't really have to use it. I only actually used it because it was heavy wet snow and I know that my driveway would have became very rutted with the like five inches of snow we got. Otherwise, if it was fluffy, I would have just packed it down with the car. I wouldn't have cared if it was fluffy. That's the reason. Yeah, snow blowing or shoveling wet snow is the worst. It's heavy, it clogs the snow blower, it's heavy to lift. But fluffy snow, the snow blower will fire it like 50 feet across the yard. It's really cool. But also fluffy snow, it'll blow right back in your face. At least heavy wet snow goes where you throw it when it's not clogging. down this hill we're getting really good MPG because I'm just hitting the brakes every now and then. It's not steep enough where I have to downshift or anything. I'm just pumping the brakes every here and there. This is supposed to be one of the most scenic roads for leaf peepers in the fall because you see it's mostly maple trees which turn a beautiful bright red or orange. This year was a lot of yellowish orange, not the right conditions. What happened this year? Um, it rained a lot, but I forget what the exact conditions are. If you want the vibrant reds, oh, it just started snowing again. I'll probably stop this vlog when we get to the bottom of the hill or so, because I actually don't know the instructions on the other side of how to get home. I'm hoping Conway has a 24-hour McDonald's, or I'll go in a gas station. I want to get a coffee for the way back, because I'll be running that smoker all night. But actually, just talking right now, that makes me more alert, talking, thinking a lot. In a drive like this, I'm not really going anywhere. I'm just driving these roads right now for my own enjoyment. There's no one else on the roads. It's nice and peaceful. Getting a lot better gas mileage, just driving slow. Getting 23 mpg. 
next couple of weeks. Maybe I'll do a camping video again at the tank camp. And this time, maybe we'll smoke something with the smoker I just made. Make that into a camping video. But this time I'm using, I think, pork shoulder, maybe pork belly. It's pretty thick, so that's why it's going to take like five, six hours to smoke it. It's pretty thick. Maybe next time I'll put something thin in there like ribs, which will only take an hour or two to properly cook in that thing. I've also thought about maybe hanging an entire turkey in there for like a full day and letting that slowly smoke. Every time I've defrosted a turkey in the fridge, it's always had a little bit of ice still inside it. Even though I follow the de defrost instructions, defrosting it by multiple days further than it's said for its weight. Maybe my fridge is just colder. I keep my fridge just above freezing because it makes food last longer. I keep it at like 34 degrees, which is just slightly above freezing. Some people keep it at like 38 or something, which is still acceptable, but the colder it is, the better it is to preserve. But maybe that's why it's always a little frosty on the inside. But I will make sure it's completely defrosted before I start smoking a turkey. Because I just don't want the dripping water coming out of it from the ice to like smother my coals in there. So I'll defrost it, maybe put it in the sink with hot water for an hour or two prior. That'll defrost anything in there before I bring it out to smoke. Or maybe I'll do something smaller, like some chicken legs, something like that. Do something like that for a camping video. But I'm not obviously not going to get a giant turkey. But that, that smoker I made is so big, I could fit probably four 25-pound turkeys in there. But I'll buy a small one that's like 11 pounds and defrost it maybe for a camp video. Or maybe I'll just do what I said and get like a smaller thing that'll cook really fast. Yeah, the turkey might make a good video. Maybe I'll do that on my food-related channel sometime. Because that'll take all day. That's not a good thing to do for camping. It makes a lot of meat. So that's probably something I'd want to bring back in the house at harvest. We'll save that thought for some other day. But I, I think that would be actually fun to smoke a turkey. Maybe we'll do that in the summer when I have some family over. It's starting to snow again. Now you can see that on the camera. It's starting to show up. Snow is a lot less here. Top there, we saw some four-foot snow banks. Now we're down to like maybe two, a little less. I do know areas like North Conway. I was there like a week ago. North Conway, New Hampshire got a ton of snow, but you drive a little further down the road and you go into towns like, what's it called? Bartlett? Bartlett? They only have like five inches, while North Conway got like over a foot that's only a 20 minute drive apart from each other. Big difference. I think it's elevation that made that happen. For some reason, the lower elevation spot got more snow. Sometimes it's backwards. All depends on air current, but usually higher up is colder, so it starts snowing more. The snow has less of a chance of evaporating before it gets to the ground because it hits the ground faster being high up. The snow looks like it's getting a little deeper here. It's good that there's no one on the road because I trust my driving when the roads and conditions get bad and icy. I don't trust other people that follow too close or oncoming cars going too fast around corners. That's what I worry about the other drivers. So I usually avoid the roads during snow unless it's late at night or I'm out in the wilderness. It don't really matter. I think I'll avoid getting spacers on the wheels for this year. Don't really need it. For this vehicle, most Toyotas actually, I was told, 
properly put chains on the front tires, you have to get a one inch spacer because the chains are too close to the strut. It has nothing to do with going around corners or anything. I already solved that. And going around corners, when you turn the wheel, it gets closer to the fender, I think it's called, the inside of the wheel well, and it can actually touch that. I lifted this truck two inches, which will completely avoid that issue, but I also need a spacer to get it away from the strut. In the back, the shocks are much further away, so the back does not need a spacer at all. And a one inch spacer is not gonna put that much strain on your wheel bearings, but it will put extra strain. So unless you actually need it, that's not a good thing to be putting spacers. Like I see some people put spacers on there because they think it looks cool. And it also allows you in a truck or a lifted truck to go around corners much faster because you have a bigger wheelbase. But it does put a lot of unnecessary strain on drive lines and um, wheel bearings having it out further like that. But one inch, I don't think that would really do much. You wouldn't even probably notice it much. But I'd probably do it on all four wheels because it might look stupid if you do it just the front. But just one inch, you don't have to get fender extensions or anything. My state, New Hampshire, Vermont, laws don't care if you have wheels going out past the wheel well but some states like Massachusetts you have to put extra fenders out to cover it for whatever reason I think it's maybe because the wheels might throw rocks that might be the reason because there's a reason vehicles have mud flaps the ones on cars and pickup trucks are usually plastic they're hard like on a big truck it's a piece of rubber that flaps those are there so rocks can't get picked up and thrown at windshields of whoever's behind you. Some big trucks that have very rugged tires can actually pick up some pretty big rocks and throw them. It's not unheard of for a big rig to get a, like a football-sized rock stuck between the double tires on a dirt road when it's going slow, get on the highway going super fast and launching it through someone's windshield. That's why the DOT will pull over a big truck if the mud flap's missing have to have a mud flap because that's rare but it could happen the double tire could get something stuck and launch it at someone's windshield but if you have tires that are out far one inch or so is not going to make a difference but I do understand why some states have that law if you have it out like a half a foot there's no protection from their um, treads catching rocks and throwing them at the vehicles following them so that's the reason for that law. Like, I don't think it's a big deal if it's going out like an inch. And I don't think a cop would even notice that. So that's not a problem, no matter where you drive.